Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Glad you're here. You know, it's that uh, starting to get toward graduation season. You've been to graduations where the speaker stands up and tells hundreds, even thousands of students, all dressed identically, how individuality will be the key to their success. <laughs> It's a wonderful world we live in. But no matter the oddities or the sometimes more painful insanities of our world, God is sovereign, God is good. We're glad you're each here. Glad for those who can join us online. Um, let me just give you a few updates on what's going on. Um, invitations, one you may have noticed on the way in, um, we have a new front yard sign. I especially want to give a, a thank you to those who helped make it happen, for Keith, for Tom McAdam, and for others. And it's just very good to have that. And uh, Sarah uh, Clemens Thompson did the uh, design of the, of the logo there, and we're just very glad for it. Um, it's, it's not quite all that it'll be because there'll be a, there's a new set of lettering that'll also add a little spark to it. Carrie will get to play with those in, in just a little bit. Uh, tonight, we have the relevant service. Hope you'll be able to join us, 5.30 p.m. Sarah's got a great message, I get to read it ahead of time, about, about celebration, and about the importance of that, and particularly about celebrating the gospel, the good news. And it's, it's worthwhile, and it fits in with some of the things you'll hear later on in this service. But uh, Roy and Kathy Gernhart will be back to lead us with music, with music and uh, they always do a great job for us, and we're glad of that. So, uh, Sarah, you just missed us saying how good we like the logo. You just missed it. <laughs> Glad you're here. Uh, Wednesday, we have our monthly service at All American Assisted Living. And uh, please, if you'd like to join us, be part of that at 1.30 p.m. And uh, you can be there a little bit ahead of that time. Or if you don't know your way, join us at a one or a touch afterward uh, for that service. It's a good time to provide care and encouragement to the folks who live there. Next Sunday. Uh, there's four young people who have been attending extra hours every week for two years now, two academic years, and we get to celebrate their confirmation. It's a very special time. I encourage you to be there. It's also Pentecost, and that's why we do it on that day. Historically, uh, confirmation is a prayer for the filling of the Holy Spirit. And so it's a great day to wear red. Bring out the red. So, yeah, the same thing again, Sandy. It's all right. <laughs> but a good red like that. I got some reds out there already. So that we're glad for that. Um, we had a great time yesterday celebrating Frank and Nancy's 50th, and, uh, and Nancy, tell him we're proud too. I know he's enjoying, you got so many special people visiting them and to celebrate and congratulate them. So what a great day. Those are the announcements I have, and uh, I just want to remind us that we gather to honor God, to love him back for his love, and to be reminded of his love. So let's uh, stand and join in the uh, opening songs as our worship team leads us. And to piggyback on what <laughs> Peter was saying, um, God is here. And so we've come to be with him. And this first song is his invitation to you to come close. Whoever believes in him will live for. 
about um, taking our life and letting it be consecrated. Consecrated, that's one of those words you don't use very often. Um, and it does mean setting it aside for God, dedicating it to God. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, for Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Here am I. Always only for my King. 
Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from me. Take my silver and my gold, not of mine would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power. from Psalm 32, verses 1, 6 through 8, and 11. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayers to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach you. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Please be seated.
great job. Thank you to everyone who, by email or personal conversation, whatever means, lets us be aware of the different prayer needs going on. There's lots to celebrate. You know, the, uh, we just, you know, one very special thing is you know, we got the word that Sandy Wilcox is cancer free. <laughs> one, one, we praise God for that, answered prayer. There's a little bit of, you know, you, sometimes, I'm, I just remember a fellow who was getting neutron treatment from a particle accelerator at the Fermi Labs in Chicago on his tumor, and he said, I just want to hear that thing scream. <laughs> and we're just trying to make anything left of yours scream. So you got a couple weeks of treatment left, but uh, we'll, we'll get that done. Um, but uh, please keep us informed about those prayers. Let's pray. God, thank you for your uh, faithfulness. We thank you for what 50 years of marriage means for, for your faithfulness and your providing for Frank and Nancy. You're leading them, you're helping them uh, through the highs and lows. And uh, Lord, for the, uh, for the grace that you make to live in each of their lives, we pray your continued blessing on them and their family. Thank you for loved ones able to vet, visit and be with and grant travel safeties for each one. Lord, we thank you for upholding Sandy through her treatment and that this, she is now cancer-free. And we pray, Lord, that you would indeed seal that healing, that, uh, that she remains so. Thank you for the grace and strength you gave to her and to Bob and their family. Uphold them, please. We also, Lord, I want to thank you. Uh, our son-in-law uh, has received a very good job offer, and we're excited about that. We thank you for that. And we th pray, Lord, for your care. Well, we want to lift to you uh, Linda, who will be having surgery on Monday, that you would be with her, that you'd be with her cousin Teddy, who's at South Shore Hospital, for you, that your touch would be very close to her at this time. Lord, that your, your healing would be upon Pete, upon Karen, upon Norma, upon Danielle. We ask that you'd be with Mike, Lord, who's in a coma after being hit by a truck. For, Lord, that you would let there be uh, recovery and healing. For Chris, she's, uh, she had trouble that, from diverticulitis, but going in to get it treated brought a kidney cancer to light that uh, has been found in time, we pray. Lord, grant there be healing. Would you be with your daughter Jane, Lord, uh, Jane Murray in pain, a good Samaritan. For Phil Brides, that there be healing for his breathing issues. Thank you, Lord, for walking with Debbie Ripley through her treatments. Grant that uh, this continue to uh, make progress. Hold her, Lord. Help her to be trusting you. With her brother Don, Lord, thank you that he is cancer-free and looking forward to retirement. And also, Lord, for Mike, who uh, has uh, another Mike who's been uh, clear of infection and sepsis, but has a six-month road ahead of him of recovery, Lord. Be with him, his mom, who will be providing care. We thank you, Lord, that when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we need fear no evil because you are with us. And so we ask that your comforting presence would be with the friends and family of Hans Batting, who will be laid to rest later this week, and also with uh, Mary McPherson and all the friends and family of, Lorraine, of Mary's sister Lorraine, who died this week. Hold them, Lord, close in your care. We do pray, Lord, for all of our graduates at different stages in their lives, that you would hold them in your care, direct their future, that they would know your will and do it. Grant them your grace and wisdom, please. We thank you for all the work and generosity that went into, the, uh, into our having now a new sign out front, Lord, and we ask that you would consecrate it for your purposes, that it would uh, share your words and that you might bless its effectiveness to encourage others to to find that you have a home for them here. Please, Lord, be with all those who are facing disruption from war, whether it be Ukraine or Sudan, that, Lord, for those who live in fear, that you would be their comfort and guide, and for those who seek to bring relief and comfort to those who are struggling, that you would bless those efforts. Lord, have your hand, please, upon our nation and all the leaders of each nation that they might recognize they are under your authority 
and be guided to do what is righteous in your sight. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for us. whether it be for the gifts that were made, worship team come on forward, uh, for the sign, but also just the many of you who helped, to, uh, who helped to sustain the ministry of this church, we are grateful. But we also know that what we do is responding to God's generosity. So Karen and I give when all of us give, we are trusting God to be our providers. And so whether you've done it with a gift of the basket in the back or you mailed something in, let us dedicate our gifts now to God. Heavenly Father, we know that when we give to you our silver and gold, and indeed not a mite would we withhold, we are placing it where it does the most good. We know that you will not neglect us. We know that you have a purpose for us and that you guide us. Help us to learn your way, to be your stewards. And as a church, Lord, as we receive gifts, May we honor you with the integrity with which we use it. And we thank you for our missions and others and pray that you might indeed let mercy, grace, and the good news spread to your honor and glory. Amen. Let's stand. The message this morning is taken from Luke chapter 1, verses 68 through 79. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, 
being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the ways of peace. This is the word of the Lord.
Thank you, Claire. If our God is with us, what could stand against? Keep that in mind. It's such a good parallel to what's going to hopefully be said in a few minutes here. I'll come up with something. <laughs> you would have thought he had more than enough income. Understandably, when best-selling author Ernest Hemingway filed for bankruptcy. News reporters wanted to know, how did that happen? And he said, two ways, gradually, then suddenly. And if you've been around, you know what he meant. First, you spend freely then you spend more than you have, but everyone is willing to lend to you. It didn't hurt to spend more than you had, so you do it again, and you kind of get in the habit. Your debt gradually increases, but you're keeping up with payments. When you fall behind, you borrow more. Every banker is your friend. But the one time there is a hiccup, the income isn't what you've been depending on, or there's an unexpected extra expense, then suddenly no one will lend. They all call in their notes, and you lose it all. And if that strikes too close to home to anybody, you have my sympathies, really. Many things happen gradually, then suddenly. In spite of the early optimism that we'll have the boys home by Christmas, World War I was stuck in the trenches and was stagnant for years. Then, while strategies for 1919 were being laid out, everything changed and armistice was declared on November 11th, 1918. To many of us who have no memory of a free Eastern Europe, or had none at the time, President Reagan's challenge to Mikhail Gorbachev Tear down this wall. It sounded like political grandstanding. But within a few years, rejoicing citizens of a reunited Berlin tore it down for him. Sudden changes occurred as a result of forces that had been gradually at work for decades. History teaches us that not just bankruptcy, but all kinds of significant change often occur after undetected forces have been at work. Sometimes the results are not good, but in life as in sports, the halftime score is not a guaranteed indicator of final results. From the miraculous creation to the remarkably resilient human spirit, we spent the last four weeks looking at God's wonders. One of his greatest powers, his, one of his greatest wonders is his power to transform what appears to be evil and turn it into good. In case it has not been apparent, my motivation for this series as your pastor and thus responsible to encourage your spiritual health and vitality has been and is to increase your trust in God. Whether you're talking about political, economic, environmental or personal issues, every day you and I must deal with problems that are beyond our personal capabilities. The only hope we have is to face those challenges in alliance with the one God who is bigger than all of them. This morning, drawing from both Old and New Testaments, my aim is to help you when your soul is longing for a change in your circumstances, to trust that nothing is too difficult for God. Be patient. He is at work and he will redeem. 
I'm grateful to Shirley for reading to us. It's the Song of Zechariah is what that's called. Zechariah of the New Testament. He's a fellow who's sometimes forgotten, although he has an important supporting role in the great drama of Christmas. The Son of God being born among human beings. Zechariah is a priest in the temple in Jerusalem, but perhaps more importantly, he's the father of John the Baptist. He sent, John is sent to prepare the way of God's Messiah, Jesus. And the song lyrics you heard that Shirley read for us come from Zechariah, who's been forced to be silent throughout his wife's pregnancy. And now he's finally free to praise God for John's birth, which puts in motion the coming of Jesus. Have you been running on fumes? I remember as a young man, there are many times that my car seemed to be running on fumes. I remember pulling up to a station, rummaging through my pockets, coming up with 60 cents, which would buy a gallon of gas for my mighty Chevy Vega. <coughs> well, Zechariah is rejoicing because his people had been running on fumes for centuries. And now they would get the ultimate full tank. He starts by celebrating that God has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. And sometimes that uh, verb looked is translated visited. But it's a very purposeful kind of visit. Literally, he's looked in on his people. When Carol's mother was growing weaker, our daughter and son-in-law would often look in on her to see what she needed. More often than not, Something had gone wrong with the TV remote, and they needed to fix that. It wasn't important in the ultimate sense, but looking in was. It was an expression of personal care. Very important. And God, Zechariah now joyfully proclaimed, had been doing just that. The hope that we've been leaning on, the fumes, that's been validated in the birth of the first of two babies. This one is the promised forerunner to the promised deliverer. But even John's birth means that at long last, the show we've been waiting for is coming into town. Not to mention all the troubles Israel had gone through in Old Testament days. But since 63 BC, and this is around the year of our Lord's birth, call it 1 AD if you want, but since 63, the Roman Empire had dominated the Holy Land. Yet now Zechariah rejoices, God's going to deliver us from the hand of those who hate us, from our enemies. He doesn't say it's going to be a military deliverance, but rather this deliverer who is to come, talking about Jesus, though he doesn't know his name yet, will give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. See, our sins would keep us from coming to God because we're not in right standing with him. But he gives us that so then we can come and we are free. Zechariah knew that this miracle birth, he and his wife had been unable to bear children until now. That it was one more example of God's powerful shepherding care. I wanted to call your attention to the last verses of Zechariah's song because he deliberately draws in the promises of the prophet Isaiah and King David, some of their greatest hits, really. Isaiah had said the people walking in darkness would see a great light. King De David celebrated what a great shepherd the Lord is. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his sake. Zechariah closes his song by saying that God was giving light to those who sit in darkness. Thank you, Isaiah. And in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the paths of peace. Thank you, King David. You know, there are easy days for shepherds. But then there are storms and thieves and sicknesses running rampant through the herd. And this can be an analogy, too. I'll let you figure that one. But only the greatest shepherd can lead their flock successfully through such hazards. 
And Zechariah proclaimed the power of God's shepherding care as he saw all the ways that God had been at work through the centuries, all of it coming together, gradually, now suddenly. Nothing is too difficult for God. Once you're allied with him, once you decide to trust that he is the good shepherd, you want to be in his flock. We just need to be patient. He is, is at work and he will redeem. <clears throat> now, in many ways, the story of Zechariah's song just corroborates that theme. But I want to focus us on the prophet Jeremiah. His struggles were so difficult and yet God came through so completely. You need to understand what he went through to help you face the very real changes you have in your life. You know, there's that great saying, be kind because everyone you meet is facing a great battle. What do we do with our great battles? Well, listen, please, as I read Jeremiah 32, 17 to 25. Jeremiah is speaking. Ah, Lord God, it is you who made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult, too hard for you. You show steadfast love to the thousandth generation, but repay the guilt of parents into the laps of their children after them. O great and mighty God, whose name is in the Lord of hosts, is the Lord of hosts, great in counsel, mighty in deed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of mortals, rewarding all the, according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. You showed signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, and to this day in Israel, and among all humankind, and have made yourself a name that continues to this very day. You brought your people, Israel, out of the land of Egypt, with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and outstretched arm, and with great terror. <coughs> And you gave them this land, which you swore to their ancestors to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they entered and took possession of it. But they did not obey your voice or follow your law. Of all you commanded them to do, they did nothing. Therefore, you have made all these disasters come upon them. See, the siege ramps have been cast up against the city to take it. And the city, faced with sword, famine, and pestilence, has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans who are fighting against it. What you spoke has happened, as you can see. Yet you, O oh Lord, have said to me, buy the field for money and get witnesses, though the city has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Okay, first thing you need to know is that God involved Jeremiah as he rescued Israel more from themselves than from Babylon. The people of Babylon were called the Chaldeans, same thing. We've gone back now to 590, 590 BC. The northern half of Israel had been overrun by the Assyrians more than 100 years before. The great Babylonian empire has been harassing and threatening Jerusalem and the southern kingdom called Judea for 30 years. And the threats keep getting closer and more dire. We've had the gradually. We're expecting the suddenly. Many of the people are angry at Jeremiah because they want to believe that God has to love them, has to protect them, has to bless their whims, even if they disobey him and engage in all kinds of immorality. Jeremiah pretty much says that's no way to treat God, the God who delivered you in the past and has blessed you. But the people in effect say, who asked you? Keep your mouth shut. You're ruining our fun. All the while, the noise of battle is getting closer. Jeremiah knows that the people's rebellion amounts to them stepping out from behind God's protection. Clearly, invasion is imminent. And God tells Jeremiah, why don't you buy a plot of land in this land that is about to be run over? It's kind of absurd. What is happening? What's he supposed to think? Is God saying, hey, throw your money away? Now God is saying, trust me. I will bring you back to this land when it's all over. 
But there's another question. <laughs> what are the optics? What will the people think while they interpret the real estate transaction to mean? Will it be, oh, he's changed his position. And he's just going to be happy that we're overrun. What will Jeremiah do? Well, Jeremiah trusted God for at least two reasons. The first is the fact of creation. He says this. Jeremiah says, Ah, Lord God, it is you who made the heavens and the earth by your great power, by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard, too difficult for you. Jeremiah knows that God, having created everything seen and unseen, has all the power he needs to accomplish whatever he purposes to do. And what he purposes to do, his purposes, are always good. Okay. And then he calls to mind God's great acts in history. And this settles Jeremiah's purpose. He remembers the exodus. You brought your people Israel out of the hand of Egypt with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and outstretched arm. You gave them this land flowing with milk and honey. The God who made the universe had clearly demonstrated that he had a special purpose for the Jews. This wasn't going to change. Jeremiah trusted God to be at work. Can you trust God to be at work? The prophet had been trusting God for quite a while now, but that trust was tested when it came time for Jeremiah to buy land. You know, it can be very easy to talk of faith, but then we have, when we have to put some serious coin into the issue, that's a time of testing. You know, make it, no mistake, there's a present predicament to what God is telling Jeremiah to do. Did Jeremiah really trust God to bring him back to this plot of land that he's forking over a truckload of shekels to buy. It's going to be exile. Might there also be deprivation? Couldn't there be a more immediate need for those pieces of silver? We tend to get very protective. Nothing tests trust in God more than this. Could Jeremiah count on God to so provide in the future that he could buy the land now? But God, in his loving, shepherding care, was loving his people by giving Jeremiah this uncomfortable task to perform. This testing of Jeremiah's trust provided a public example of obedience in spite of the risks. It's like the priests stepping into the Jordan River ahead of the people and before the water had stopped flowing. They took the first step and the people followed. You might need to do something like that for someone you know, someone you love who is afraid. Model faith and trust in God. You know, I didn't always agree with John Paul II, but I understood why he chose to not resign his leadership position in spite of debilitating illness. Remember that? He seemed to hang on for a number of years. He knew we live in a culture that denies the impact of death, and especially the moment of utter dependence on God. So he chose to stay active as much as he could while dying, so the world could see a Christian believer trusting God to see him through. Like Jeremiah, or likewise, Jeremiah trusted that whatever lay ahead when Babylon took over, God would still be the real ruler. Whatever happens to you, God will still be the real ruler. Jeremiah did not resist when it came time to go to Babylon. In the next chapter, we read, Yet I will bring Judah and Israel back from captivity. That's what God's saying. Jeremiah knew God was calling him to obey him while contributing to the health of the city and the new land. It didn't mean God was not at work, gradually then suddenly. Jeremiah's trust was rewarded. Many people who went to Babylon in the exile were still alive when the time came to return to Jerusalem and dedicate a new rebuilt temple. 
God restored his people. He kept his promises. And he taught the people to love and honor him again. Is there something in your life that you are waiting for change? Something going on? Something that makes it difficult to trust God or at least to challenge? If so, it's all the more important to trust him. I know it can look like all the difficulties are stacked against you. You've had a difficult diagnosis. God will be with you. That relationship seems fractured beyond repair. The same God who brought his wayward child Israel back to himself will hold you as you cry. And will show you steps so you can rebuild. Maybe you're facing financial ruin. All these challenges and more can be faced victoriously. <clears throat> Let me provide you three principles to cling to. The first is remember. Zechariah did it. Jeremiah did it. Remember the great acts of God in the process. In the, as you're going through the process, remember what God has done in the past. This is why church and Bible study, personal and corporate, it's not optional. You can never draw from this treasury of knowing how God has come through in the past. In the Bible, in the history of other believers. If you haven't taken time to learn them, to hear them, to incorporate them. Both Zechariah and Jeremiah proclaimed what God had done. They took heart because God had come through in the past. Learn from their stories. Learn from the stories of your small groups. Let them share their histories, how God has answered prayer. Share with one another how God has come through in your life. Somebody might need to draw from that. It'll help you breathe. It'll help you sleep. Because you remember, rely. You'll have something to rely on. This is the point where you walk by faith, where you buy the land, where you support your son, if you're Zechariah, to follow God's call, even if it leads to prison and execution. When we draw our last breath, whenever, will we say, okay, God, here I come. Well, let's say it when people speak ill of you. Say it when you have to go on with your life after getting that diagnosis. The same God who has acted faithfully toward his people in the past will do the same in your life. Remember what he has done. Rely on him to do it again. Remember and rely. And then rejoice. Don't forget the party. Celebrate the good things God has done. And this is, this is wonderful. Sarah didn't know that I was going to be saying this when she planned and prepared to talk about how do you celebrate the good news of God. Come tonight for that. If you have to, tune in on the live stream. But come and support Sarah. Well, and at the end of August, we're going to have a party. Not only because it will mark 275 years of existence for this church, but we also need to celebrate that God has brought us through a, well, some would say rather wild time the last three years. You might not have noticed, but it's all right. Look at the book of Nehemiah sometimes. After the work comes the party. Jesus frequently attended celebrations. Nothing is too difficult for God. Be patient. He is at work and he will redeem. Remember, rely, rejoice. Carol and I have a friend, I'll call her Kay, who lived for decades in a very difficult marriage. Chronic illness changed her husband. Life was never easy or fun. His illness continued to demand more and more of her, even as his personality soured. 
And then a little more than five years ago, the struggle was over. And Kay, now widowed, was exhausted. She hardly knew which way was up. Every part of her, body, mind, and spirit, was spent. Could God make a change? And I'm pleased to report that for Kay, love came as a surprise after sadness. Last fall, Carol and I stood with a couple dozen others to witness Kay's marriage to a kind, capable, and thoughtful widower who was rejoicing to find such a fine woman. Both of them had gone through sadness. Both of them had wondered if life could be good again. And yet God was at work in the secret places, helping to make joy come where tears had been flowing. Uh, he treats her like a treasure. And you should see her beam. <laughs> it's like desert flowers coming up after a rain. I know there are challenges to our lives, to yours, to mine. I also remind you that we have so much to be thankful for. Whatever is the change that needs to happen, it may start gradually, unseen, but then suddenly. The same God who has blessed us, even with a fellowship of love and sharing and caring, can be trusted with what lies ahead. Nothing is too difficult for God. Be patient. He is at work. He will redeem. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for your faithful care. We thank you that you are strong. That for those who were in the midst of deep struggle, the past you have come through. And many of us can testify to how you have come through. Help us in the challenges we face to trust you to put our hope in you and speak in faith of you. Give your grace especially to those facing what they fear are unsurmountable challenges. Nothing is too difficult for thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Cindy's chosen a great hymn for us, Give to the Winds Your Fears. Please stand with me. It's number 618 in the hymnal. especially share some conversation and encouragement with one another. Now, if you'd receive the benediction, O Lord God, we do walk into this world trusting you. We do not know what is ahead, but we know you are there. And so, Lord, we choose this day to walk with you. Put your blessing upon each one that they may be your witness to your greatness and goodness and might behold your 
grace and joy. Pray in Jesus' name.